We'll, we'll begin in the 19th chapter of the book of Proverbs. I, I used these verses of scripture a few months ago, maybe a couple months, a few months ago on, uh, for, our, for a business meeting, for a devotional, brief devotional for a business meeting. Um, here the last couple of weeks, they've, they've been on my heart, and as we prepare for, not reading because I don't have glasses, as we prepare for the year ahead and what, what our year holds and what we're going to do, I've had a lot of thoughts. I, 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 there's just a whole lot. Um, I have some things I'll share with you, hopefully throughout the year, and some things, maybe some, some desires that I have and things I would like to see, maybe. Uh, that's not for this morning. Maybe that's for somewhere down the road. There are things that I would love to see our church be able to do and accomplish. Um, and, and hopefully we can maybe do some of those. And with God's help, I believe we can accomplish anything he puts upon our hearts. But I think in order to do that, and one of the things that I, I want to ask you all to pray about, and this, this is not easy for me anyway, to, to ask this. I never like to ask prayer for, for myself, for my family, and uh, you all do far too much for, for us anyway. But in this upcoming year, I, I ask you to pray that any restrictions, any, um, anything that binds me from just really pouring out what God lays upon my heart. I ask you all to pray that those things might be removed, whatever they may be. And I, it can, if it's personal, let those things be removed. If it's, uh, if it's whatever the case may be, if there's anything that hinders me from being able to feed you the flock, I want you all to pray this year that those things might be just removed, just totally gone. Not even, that they don't exist anymore. I believe that our God can remove those. I believe that he can open doors. I believe that he can uh, uh, just totally release us of the bondage of the things of this world and the things that hold us back. And they, you may say, preacher, what are they? I'm not going to get into uh, individual things. I, there's a lot of times I do things with, with the best of intent, but I do them wrong. I mess things up sometimes. And, and uh, I just pray that you all would help me to pray about those things that I might be able to feed you all by the word of God. I don't know any man of God that's ever stood in this pulpit anyway that has a desire to, um, to reap benefit for himself. I think every man from all of our preachers that we have here at our church to those that have come in here for revivals and those that come and fill in uh, in the, the pastor's absence and all those, I, I believe that every single one of those men that have ever stood in this pulpit have a sincere desire to serve God and do what he would lay upon their heart. I don't believe it's ever been done out of earthly or uh, personal gain or desire for those things, uh, but I believe it's always been done. And that's every time we stand to preach, we need to be prayerful that it would feed the flock every time. Not sometimes, not occasionally. I want it to be every Sunday morning. I want you to be fed. And if I'm failing in that, I want you all to pray that I would fix whatever it is that it might be able to, to accomplish God's will in your hearts and in your life. I want to... Uh, I often see people, they'll, 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 uh, they'll follow pastors or preachers and they'll say, well, he's, he's just got this or that. And I see uh, churches where people just flock to hear a pastor stand and preach or, or speak sometimes. And I'm always wondering, what is that it that they have? What is that thing that they have? Often they're charismatic. I am not. Often they're good looking. I am not. Remind me to exclude Brother Gale next business meeting. <laughs> we always look around, we wonder, what is that? And we always hear that thing, what is it that he has? Or what is that it that she has? Or what is that that, that they have? And I'll tell you one thing that I have often found is the one thing that a lot of people have is personal ideas 
about the Word of God. And I don't want to have those. I want to have an understanding of the Word of God. I want to have a knowledge and a wisdom of the Word of God. And I want to be able to bring that out for you all in a way that it feeds you so that you leave here saying it's been good to hear the Word of God. And I cannot stand upon my personal opinions, my personal thoughts, or my personal ideas. It's got to be, thus saith the Lord. So I ask you all to pray for that. I always want that to be the case. I've always desired that. But it's just been on my heart this week that I ask you all to pray to that end. Having said that, I want to look in the 19th uh, uh, chapter of the book of Proverbs for two verses of Scripture uh, that I want to take my thought from. Uh, that was terrible grammar. From which we'll take a thought. How's that? In the 19th chapter... Of Proverbs, and I've often said that if, if people of our world would just simply take the book of Proverbs and read the book of Proverbs, study the book of Proverbs, and apply the book of Proverbs to their life, their life would be different. Their life would be better. You don't, I, you don't even have to be a theologian to, to, to just read the Proverbs and understand the wisdom that is laid out for us that you and I might have a wonderful life just in the book of Proverbs. We don't even have to get into a lot of other stuff. We can just read these things and we can just have the wisdom of God imparted upon our lives in a powerful way. I've had the young folks on my heart the last few weeks I'll tell you, there's, there's, and I'm, I'm going to try to, again, not ever get into personal feelings and opinions. But our young folks, and I know that uh, you all, the folks that are my age and older, you may say, well, we've had our share of problems too. We absolutely have. We've had our share of difficulties. And we've had our share of issues. Uh, but I'm telling you, we have never experienced a bombardment of sin upon our lives like our young folks are experiencing now. I'm just telling you. That's just facts, and you can, we can debate that after service. You can pull me aside and say, Preacher, I don't think that's the case. Let me tell you, I, I can, I'll give you a list of reasons why I believe that, and I've outlined some of those uh, in the past, but I'm, I'm, I just want our young folks to know that there is something better than what the world is trying to promote in your life. There is a better way. There is something positive. There is something good that can be there through every step of your life. And I don't care at what point you are in your life, whether you're younger, whether you're middle-aged, whether you're older. It doesn't matter to me. I believe that the Word of God contains the wisdom and the knowledge that you need for that point in your life. It's there we just got to dig it out sometimes. And sometimes it's not always easy. Sometimes it requires us to study the Word a little bit. Not just read it, but study it and dig into it and try to dissect it. Look at words and figure out what they mean. And then we can find that we start to have a deeper understanding and knowledge of what God is trying to tell us from His Word. Not just young folks. You may be 60 and saying, well, I need to learn a little bit more about the Lord. Get into the Word of God. Study it. Apply it. Dissect it. Digest it. Spend time in it. And here we find that in these two verses of Scripture, we find that I think it sums up a lot of the whole Word of God in two verses of Scripture. Hear counsel and receive instruction that thou mayest be wise in thy latter end. There are many devices in a man's heart. Nevertheless, the counsel of the Lord, that shall stand. That shall stand. I want you to think about that second verse there. There are, there are many devices, uh, many plans, many ideals, many schemes in the hearts of men. But the counsel of God Almighty, that will absolutely stand the test of time when men's devices, plans, and ideals have fallen apart and come to ruin. 
We see that politically in our world today. Everybody is so divided and everybody is so uh, uh, torn up over one way or the other. Folks, if we would apply the simple word of God into our lives, much of that would go away. We could get rid of a lot of that dissension. We could get rid of a lot of those problems. But what we find is that there are so many things that are bombarding us from so many different directions. And if I have instruction for you today for 2024, it would be that we hear the counsel of the Almighty. That we dig into the Word of God, that we pay attention and we find that if we uh, uh, try to look at those words, that counsel means the advice, the advice that God gives us for a wholesome, happy, joyous, fulfilled life. Brother Daniel gave the devotional in the men's breakfast the last time. And one of the things that he said that stuck with me was oftentimes people feel like we're just trying to, to preach that you get saved so that you feel better today. When in fact, God is desiring, and I love the fact that he brought that out, and I've thought about it before, but, but I just didn't think it really resonated with anybody else. But, but then he, he said if we would realize that God is actually desiring a relationship, not just temporarily, but eternally. It's bigger than the moment when we find ourselves lost and separated from God. It's an eternity that God desires. God wants us to be in a relationship with Him from now and forevermore. And even when we come to the end of our life and we close our eyes in death, our relationship with God is not severed. Folks, I'll be more alive. I think it was Peg McCamey that said that. I'll be more alive when I'm gone than I am today. You'll see a shell of a man. Ugly maybe, Brother Gail. You'll see the shell of a man laying before you, my friends, but what you can't see is that which is more alive because of what Jesus did for me on the cross of Calvary. You want to really have a good 2024? Hear the counsel of God. And young folks, let me tell you, and, I, and I'll say this, older folks, you may say, well, I don't need all that social media. You're absolutely right. You don't. I don't either. Our young folks are entrenched in it. It's a normal way of their life at this point. It is what they see. It's what is in front of them all the time. And I dare say I don't think it's ever going away. But I look occasionally and see, and I look more than occasionally. I look at things and, and uh, you may say, well, I have Facebook. Let me tell you, Facebook is Mickey Mouse Clubhouse. All right, Facebook is nothing. You tell a young person they've got Facebook, they'll just smile, most of them. Is that right? If I say I got Facebook, you're just going to smile at me, aren't you? If I, got, if I got Snapchat or Instagram and who knows what else is out there that they don't tell us old folks about that they're using to communicate on a regular basis. They don't want us to know what's out there. They want it to be theirs. I get it. We all have those things and those times. But what we find is that all that stuff that we see on, on TikTok and Instagram and, and uh, uh, Snapchat and all these things that are out there, uh, Snapchat's one-to-one, -one, I guess, more, but all these others, what we find is that those are just tools. Those are just ways and means by which things are being worked into the lives of our young folks at a greater rate than you and I could have ever, ever imagined. It's being constantly shown to them and told them, here's why I bring this out again, is because we need to hear wise counsel, good advice, what is beneficial for their life. And my friends, the things that they're seeing on uh, uh, social media, the things that are even being given them in schools oftentimes, the things that often we see that, that, that is available to them out here in the world, my friends, those are the things that are influencing many of our young people. They're not coming to church anymore. They're we leaving the church. They're saying, well, uh, that old-fashioned way doesn't make sense to me. Why? Because they haven't heard, and that is, folks, you can blame whoever you want to. You can say, well, it's on them for not trying to learn. Let me tell you, I think the church has a responsibility in that. 
I think preachers have a responsibility in that. It doesn't matter whether it's 2024, whether it's 3024, or it's 5024. The Word of God is consistent. It's awesome. It's perfect. It is exactly what we all need in our lives. Why? Because it's relevant. Absolutely it's relevant. Absolutely, it is beneficial for your life and for mine. And we find here when it says that thou mayest be wise in thy latter end. You want to know why Scripture is so important? Because it's eternal. It's eternal. It's not temporary. Everything else our young folks see and know, everything that I'm so caught up in, having the latest gadgets and the latest this and the latest that and having the best of this or the best of that, all that stuff is going to burn up one day after a while. It's all going to be gone. It's going to be forgotten. And folks, I'll tell you, I won't be in the grave a very few years and people won't even remember who I was. You say, well, preacher, that sounds harsh. It's reality. It's reality. The fact of the matter is, I got... Two generations after me, and who knows if my great-grandchildren will even know what my name was. I think about it, and can you tell me your great-grandparents' names? I can tell you one side of my family, the side that I was closest to. The other side, I don't even know who they were. Never heard of them. They don't, don't know their names. So there's problems with that, because our legacy doesn't continue. But if there's a legacy I want to continue, it would be that McFerrin always stand upon the truth. I want my great-grandchildren, I want your great-great-grandchildren to be able to come to this place and hear the Word of God proclaimed, hear that Jesus is still the King, that He is the King of kings, He is the Lord of lords, and that He died that all men might be saved. I want our kids to know that there is a right way and a wrong way to live. And even if the world tells us that all this outside stuff is the right way, we need to hear wise counsel and know that God tells us that His way and His way alone is good and right. Even in the midst of everything that we see going on in our world and we see all these people and, and folks that are uh, uh, carrying on and, and I see now how that Satan's uh, uh, devices, the plans and the tools that Satan is using to cause our children uh, and, great ch and grandchildren and great-grandchildren and generations to follow, how that all these little devices are used. They're simple implants that they might be able to somewhere down the road pull people away. What we see happening in our church today uh, and all of our churches today is that the result of, of us maybe, and I'm not saying McFerrin's ever done this, but, but maybe somewhere along the way we've gotten a little weak on some things. Maybe we need to get a little stronger on some things. Maybe we need to just drive doctrine home a little bit more. Maybe people need to understand why when they leave the church, why we feel it's wrong. When they're going somewhere else, I had, a, I had a text this week, and I'll ask y'all to pray about it. I had a text this week from a young man who said he's probably never going to come back to our church. Whose fault is that? His? Mine? Yours? Ours? There's a lot of different variables involved in that, but I'll tell you what. Our kids need to learn the truths of the Word of God. They need to understand these doctrines. They need to know why this is right and why they need to understand why. It's not because we're missionary Baptists. It's not because you're at McFerrin. It's not because of who your mama and daddy is. It's not because of how long somebody's been a member of this church. It's not because of the, the, uh, your name, if the name of Sisk had been on the, the roll since the day that McFerrin uh, was organized. It wouldn't matter if our name had been on the rolls from the beginning and is now and is until the end of time, folks, that does not get us into heaven. That does not make us justified. That doesn't make us the, the, uh, the authority on everything, folks. Jesus Christ is our authority. Now, God is the one that can impart all manner of wisdom unto our souls, and we need to stand firm on doctrine. And if our kids have questions about it, we need to answer them. We need to be ready to answer those questions. I had a, a young lady come up the other day and asked a very tough question. Well beyond her years. We got to be ready. Kids want to leave the church? Let's ask them why. 
Let's not just say, well, they just want to go somewhere else. Folks, why do people want to go somewhere else? Let's get into reasons. Let's get into figuring it out. And let's help them understand that this is the truth. The Word of God is truth. It's not because it's me preaching, but because God is the one that made this Word available to us. He's the one uh, that inspired men to write these things down. And even that is being challenged on a daily basis. Everybody now wants to challenge every single verse of Scripture. Everybody wants to challenge whether or not our God is real. And let me tell you, I can say beyond the shadow of a doubt because I know what God did for me. Take the Bible out of it. You remove that for a minute. I know what God did when He uh, burned my heart with conviction and let me know that I was going to hell. That was God dealing with me. That wasn't just some man up here preaching, dealing with me. I can't even give you a list of the men that have preached the gospel through the years. Might come close, but I couldn't give you all of them. Folks, it's God's working that makes a difference in our life. Not the man that stands in this pulpit. That's a, that is, God uses a man for a particular purpose, for a particular span of time. And after that, there'll be another man. And when I'm gone from here, there'll be another man standing right here. And it better always be a man. That's Baptist doctrine. Baptist doctrine. Better always be a man standing in this pulpit. Because if we depart from that, we've departed the truth. Departed the faith. I'm not a chauvinist. We can get into that whole debate somewhere down the road too. But folks, we need to stand firm on the Word of God. We need to hear counsel. That means hear what God has to say. Do you know that 2 Timothy tells us that that this counsel of God, the Scriptures, what we have before us, it says uh, in 2 Timothy 3 and 15, and that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures. Our little ones, we could start out here with, with some of these little bitty ones that are out here in this congregation, and we could ask them, what, what does the Bible say? And most of them could tell us a few things. Doesn't take them very long. What's John three sixteen say? Well, they can tell us. Doesn't take them very long to be able to say those things. But folks, just because you can quote Scripture doesn't mean you're going to heaven. Just because you say, well, I know what this means and that means, that's not going to get you there either, my friend. If God is dealing with you like He was for me, the reason I know God is real is He was dealing with me. He he, he placed conviction in my heart. I knew at that point I was going to hell. There was no doubt, no debate, no man could tell me. As many men that I heard preach, sermon after sermon after sermon, did not matter. God drove conviction into my heart. He said, you are going to die and when you die if you don't get it right before then you are separated from me eternally separated not just doesn't mean you know I'm going to go behind that door it means I will never be in his presence eternally when Daniel talked about realizing that salvation is not temporary it's eternal folks that's what it means God desires that we be with him eternally Have you ever had that kind of a moment in your life when you know God just drove it into your heart that that Jesus died for you, that Jesus loved you, this king that we just sang about who uh, is sitting at the right hand of the Father making intercession today. He was alive. He was perfect, holy, righteous, and sinless. And he died that you might be able to live eternally. He died for you. I'm talking about a man who was perfect and holy, sinless and loved. Can you imagine? Not everybody in this room could say, well, Brother Jeremy's always treated me with love. Especially my family. I don't always treat them with love. I should. But I haven't always done so. But Jesus loved everybody. Even the tables of the money changers that he overturned, he was in love with the people that he was defending. He loved even those that he turned the the tables over. He loved those that were driving the nails into his hand. Jesus asked for their forgiveness because they didn't understand the significance and the impact of what they were doing. But my friends, Jesus desired that even they would come to forgiveness. 
that they would come to understand who it was that they were nailing on that old cross, who it was that they were sacrificing there on a tree and the sacrifice that he was making for all of mankind. God let me know, and it was shortly uh, before September the 19th of 92 when I got saved on that old leather couch, my friend. Shortly before that, it really became a heavier burden to me than it ever had been before. I knew I was lost for a while. But when that conviction really, really, really set in, and I realized that I really was lost and that I was going to hell, and it didn't matter if I went to church with Shannon or if I didn't go to church with Shannon or if I didn't go to church anywhere, I knew at that point my condition was fixed and I was bound for hell. Unless, unless there was an intervention. And my friends, I want you to understand The reason I can stand before you and proclaim that God is real in the midst of all these people that say our God is not real, the people that say this is just a fairy tale, it's made up and it's written by men and they don't know what they were talking about, the reason I can stand before you today and say unequivocally that I believe this to be true is because on September the 19th of 1992, I prayed unto the Father. I prayed and I begged for God to relieve that burden of sin that had set up in my heart that I knew was real, knew it because I felt it. It wasn't something I thought. It was something I felt deep down inside of me. And then that night when I asked God to forgive me, when I put my trust and faith in Jesus, and I, in a true, repentant, broken, crushed heart and spirit, turned to God, and asked him to forgive me. It was in that moment that that burden was relieved. It was gone. Gone forevermore. Let me tell you, I get convicted of sin and things that I do wrong, but I will never be convicted of being lost ever again. That's Baptist doctrine. Once saved, always saved. The world doesn't like it. The world tried to tear us apart on it. I'm telling you, I believe the Word of God says that when we're saved by God's grace, it's fixed. It's sealed under the day of redemption, my friend. I believe that it is eternal salvation, not temporary salvation. And because of what God did for me on that old leather couch, if I hadn't known it before, I knew then He was real. Because he made a difference in my heart. He took away a burden, a heavy burden that I knew I was lost and replaced it with love and peace and joy. I don't know about you. If you don't have that in your life, I'm not talking about an exact same experience, but I'm talking about if you've never come to a point where you experience the love of God flooding into your soul and the burden of sin being released. Folks, we believe in repentance. We believe in faith. We believe in a broken heart. We believe in a contrite spirit. We believe in that convicting power of God sitting in and letting somebody know that they're lost and separated. And then God speaking peace to that soul. That burden rolls out. Peace rolls in. And then you know that you have become, as is on the front of the bulletin, a new creature in Christ Jesus. And Folks, if you don't have that in your life, My desire is this morning that 2024 would be the year, the time that it would be this. I would love for it to be this morning that you'd come to a place of repentance and seek God for the salvation of your soul. Even our children know that the scriptures point us uh, to Jesus. But we learned later on, just as I did when I got saved, that they're able to make thee wise unto salvation. Do you have that in your heart this morning? Doesn't matter to me. Let me tell you. Doesn't matter to me if you've been a member of McFerrin for 20 years. If you've not been saved, you need to get saved. I know that's hard for people to process, but I have had to rebaptize people that said that joined the church that weren't really saved. And I'm thankful that God worked in their hearts and let them know that they needed to get saved. They got saved, they joined the church. And it was real scriptural baptism the next time. I don't know what God's dealing with in your life and in your heart, but my friends, if you want to have the best possible life you can have, if you want to know the whole counsel of God, and that is the gospel, I believe, reveals the counsel of God. I believe that the gospel, we can turn over to the 20th book of Acts, uh, and we can see in that 20th chapter, a 20th chapter of the book of Acts, we can look over there in the 20th chapter, and we can see that repentance and faith are outlined. We can see uh, that uh, the apostle desired to know Jesus before them, to tell them about a Savior who was crucified, and we can go over there just for a minute. Let's go to the uh, 20th chapter of the book of Acts. 
I'll be done here in a minute. Maybe. Be done when the Lord's done. Twenty chapter of the book of Acts. 21st verse says, Testifying both to the Jew and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Doesn't matter to me, and I believe, really, it doesn't matter to God who you are, what you are, what you think you are, or what lineage you possess, my friends. Everybody needs to come to Jesus. Everybody. And then we find down in the latter verses, the 28th verses. It says, Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which, hath purchased, which he hath purchased with his own blood. For, this, for I know this, look in this, this 29th verse, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. My friends, I truly believe that the church is currently being bombarded by those that desire to rip and tear the sheep. I believe the church has been bombarded in a greater way than we ever have, and I want you to always be careful and always be mindful, always pay attention to whatever the man of God that stands here is preaching, and I appreciate your all support, I appreciate your love, but if I preach heresy, you remove me. Don't wait till I'm done. Take me out beforehand. Remove me. Don't let me finish a, a, a thought that's going to mislead and, 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 and cause somebody to die and go to hell. Remove me before that happens. And if you see that some, any man, whether it be me or anybody else, don't let him finish those statements. It says, For also uh, of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. My friends, this is happening now. It's happening today. If we look around, we can see that there is, uh, and people talk about the fall away. Let me tell you, I believe we're in the midst of it. I looked around this morning. I looked at all the empty spaces in these pews. And there's a lot. We could fill up these two sections and maybe these two sections, and I think there'll still be plenty of room. To be honest with you. There's room beside you, there's room in front of you, there's room behind you, there's room around you for those that need to hear the truth of the Word of God. And I ask you to pray that this place would draw them and that God would draw them to this place, that they might be able to hear the truth of the Word of God. And if this man's not feeding you, find the one that will. But they need to be fed. The church needs to be fed, and the people of our world need to hear the truth that they might be saved. And folks, I'm telling you, we've got to get back to hearing the wise counsel of God. Brother Marty, if you get a song. Lost person, I want you to understand, the wisest counsel and the best advice I can give you is to seek Jesus. Seek God with all that you have and all that you are. If you know you're lost and you know you're separated... I don't know what uh, is up with people anymore. It seems like you just about have to, have to drag some people to the altar to get them to pray. I'm thankful to hear that Hope and others were on the altar. I don't know if it's a lack of something on my part or something else, but, but there was a time when you didn't have to beg people to come to the altar. They got tore up back here in the pews and they'd run to an altar. Or they'd sink back there where they were. They wouldn't wait for an altar prayer. Or they wouldn't wait for an invitation. Well, they'd be up there pouring their hearts out because the Word of God had made an impression in their life. Maybe we all need to pray. Maybe we need to pray that the Word will have a greater effect. You need to pray for your preacher, I guarantee you. We need to pray for our other brothers that are out there preaching. We need to pray that the churches will be strengthened. In the midst of a world that's trying to tear us apart, let us be strengthened by the Word of God. Let us hear wise counsel. Turn to Him, asking Him to direct us. And folks, I believe 2024 will be a better year than 2023. And it was a good year. Had a great year. Had a lot of additions to the church. But folks, I'd like to see it be 10 times that. Why? Because people need to be saved. The church needs to be encouraged. The church needs to be strengthened. Nothing does that better, I don't think, than seeing souls saved and people joining the church. So let's pray. Let's pray that it'll continue and it'll be even better. Brother Marty.